to you, Pendle. Okay, great. So let, let's go for it. All right. Sounds great. It's recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar about BlackRock's role in Amazon destruction. My name is Nancy Mancias. I am a campaign organizer with Code Pink. I am joined by my co-facilitators who will introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Carly. I um, work on the Divest from the War Machine campaign with Code Pink. My name is Cody and I also work with the Divest from the War Machine campaign in Code Pink. And uh, we also, and Kelsey, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the uh, participants, please. Yes, hi, I'm Kelsey, and I'm a uh, part of Code Pink's Divest from the War Machine campaign. I've been here for about two months. I'm excited to be on the call. Great, and we want to know who you are. Thank you so much for join, uh, joining us. So please add your first name and where you are from and what inspired you to join us today. Today, our guest is Pendo Marshall Hallmark. Pendo is a climate campaigner at Amazon Watch. She has extensive field experience in the United States and Latin America. Before joining Amazon Watch, she worked as an international human rights accompanier with activists in Colombia and later completed a Fulbright scholarship in Mexico City, exploring socially and environmentally responsible business practices. She studied sociology at Swarthmore College and has completed master's level coursework in business administration at Mexico Autonomous Institute of Technology. Welcome, Pendo. I'll go ahead and pass it on to Kelsey, who will get us started. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to everyone who's joining us on this call. Pendle, I'm really excited to learn more from you about your campaign to expose BlackRock for their role in profiting from the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. I'm wondering if you could tell us all a little more about Amazon Watch, um, the work you all do, and how you all develop your campaigns. Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you all for having me. and. Um, I had sort of incorporated answers to, to some of the anticipated questions into my presentation. So um, if I can go ahead and start that presentation and I will uh, hopefully answer, uh, get to the point that you just brought up. Um, so yeah, if you just wanna hit present. Um, <clears throat> awesome, so I'm just gonna start. Um, my name's Pendle Marshall Hallmark, as was said, and I'm uh, also relatively new uh, to Amazon Watch. I just started as a climate campaigner um, pretty recently. And um, I'm just gonna explain a little bit about um, what Amazon Watch is uh, before I get into um, the campaign that we've been working on with BlackRock. Um, so Amazon Watch is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1996 to protect the rainforest and advance the rights of indigenous peoples um, throughout the Amazon basin. And we partner with indigenous and environmental organizations in campaigns for human rights, for corporate accountability, and for the preservation of the Amazon's ecological systems. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why BlackRock is a target of ours because I know that Code Pink is also doing some organizing um, against BlackRock. And so I wanted to explain a little bit of why it's a target for a lot of environmentalist groups right now. Um, and some of this you all may already know, um, but uh, BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager. Um, as of uh, the end of uh, Q4, fourth quarter, of 2019, December 31st, 2019, uh, it had a total of over 7.43 trillion assets under management. So it's an incredibly powerful um, asset management company. Uh, it owns uh, a majority stake of, in shares of most major publicly traded companies in the world. Um, and because of its position, it has a really important uh, say in a lot of leadership decisions on these companies' um, boards. So it really sets an example for a lot of other asset managers, uh, excuse me, asset management firms um, around the world. Um, and uh, that's important because where BlackRock is putting its money says a lot about where it thinks um, 
uh, we should be investing um, in the future? Um, and what are sort of the important industries and economies to be supporting right now? And um, according to our own research, Amazon Watch recently published a report um, uh, uh, just last month, actually. Um, as of uh, the end of 2019, BlackRock has about $2.46 billion invested um, in crude oil extraction companies operating in the Western Amazon um, region. And because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, the value of these shares may have obviously significantly changed since the end of 2019 um, due to the impact that the coronavirus pandemic is having um, on the fossil fuel industry. I'm sure as a lot of you know, um, uh, the, the fossil fuel industry is, is seeing significant um, limits uh, in, in its value. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, the companies that BlackRock is currently invested in have a long history of violating indigenous people's rights to free prior and informed consent, um, also known as FPIC. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that later on. But essentially, that's a that's a really key um, right that indigenous peoples have to be consulted before their land is uh, used for any kind of extractive purposes um, or really used by any outside um, companies. So a lot of the companies that BlackRock is currently invested in have a long history of violating indigenous peoples rights to this right um, and uh, of also wreaking havoc um, on uh, their environmental um, uh, uh, on the environment. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, BlackRock is, uh, has majority shareholder status. That means it owns over 5% of shares um, in uh, ADM and Bunge, which are two of the largest deforestation driving soy companies currently operating um, in the Brazilian Amazon. So when we're talking about the destruction that BlackRock is, is having on um, biomes like the Amazon, um, we're not just talking about fossil fuel extraction, we're also talking about deforestation commodities. Um, and uh, ADM and Bunge are uh, soy companies. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to explain what BlackRock's big problem is in just a second. Um, so Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock, um, and he's sort of known as the consciousness of Wall Street. Um, he gets a lot of credit for his speeches about environmental responsibility and the importance of sustainable finance. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he recently came out with this letter that sort of rocked the finance world a, a few months back, which was um, sort of admitting that the company needed to do more um, to prioritize sustainable investing. Um, but when you really look closely at what BlackRock's policies are um, and where it's putting its money, um, you can see that the, com that the company's performance doesn't actually reflect the stated values uh, of its CEO. Um, so if you can go to the next uh, slide, please. So you might have to hit it a couple times. What is BlackRock's big problem? Um, this is the campaign that uh, Amazon Watch uh, has been um, uh, working on in collaboration with a number of other groups. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, the campaign was launched in 2018 and um, it's a global network of NGOs and social movements that are pressuring asset managers like BlackRock uh, to align their business practices with a climate safe world. And so the major partners on this, um, uh, on this initiative are, of course, ourselves, Amazon Watch, the Sunrise Project, not to be confused with Sunrise Movement, um, Friends of the Earth, Divest Invest Network, uh, Sierra Club, and a few others. And um, basically, we're, uh, we're calling on BlackRock to divest from any and all fossil fuel companies that refuse um, to transition to clean and sustainable energy. So actually, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I also want to back up and just explain that BlackRock's big problem is specifically targeting BlackRock um, as an asset manager, but it's part of a much larger coalition of other campaigns and, and organizations and groups um, called the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition. Um, and the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition is a collection of indigenous groups, environmental activists, 
um, NGOs that are calling for an end to the financing of climate destruction, um, not only from asset managers, but also from major banks, from insurance companies, from university endowments, and from pension funds. So sort of looking at the pipeline, if you will, of money that is contributing to climate destruction because it's investing in, in um, climate destructive industries like the fossil fuel industry or uh, deforestation rich commodities like soy, beef, um, other agribusiness uh, industries. Okay, so now we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the demands of, of the BlackRock specific campaign um, as it fits into the larger Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition. Um, and, uh, and you know, I can I can go into more detail on any of this uh, during the Q and A section if anybody's curious. Um, but essentially, the main demands uh, are for BlackRock to divest um, from any and all fossil fuel companies that refuse to transition to a clean and sustainable uh, energy sourcing. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's another demand to make fossil fuel and deforestation free funds the default option for clients. Um, so if anybody's not super familiar with, with investing, um, what we mean by that is that a lot of times if you have money saved in a retirement account, uh, you have a 401k, you have an IRA, uh, Roth IRA, um, any kind of retirement account, even if it's handled mostly or managed mostly by your employer, um, BlackRock is a company that would be handling or managing those funds. And a lot of times they just get put into um, uh, just automatically put into a lot of industries like fossil fuel industries, like deforestation uh, commodity industries that are obviously contributing to climate, uh, to climate change. So um, the major demand of this campaign is to make those kinds of funds um, opt in. So to basically make the default option for anybody that's investing um, with BlackRock to be uh, completely uh, climate destruction free funds. Um, and then another really important uh, key demand of the uh, of the campaign is for BlackRock to use its shareholder power um, and its majority shareholder status in most major publicly traded companies, as I mentioned earlier, um, to uh, uh, to really push these companies to align their their business practices with a livable planet. So to to ask them, you know, if uh, after we sign the Paris Accords, I'm sure everyone here is is uh, familiar with. Um, companies, governments around the world uh, are being called to align their fossil fuel emissions um, with a, a scenario that would reduce, um, that would reduce the amount of uh, global, uh, global emissions to uh, 1.5, to an, an increase of only 1.5 degrees. Um, so we really only have 10 years left to do this. And so having the um, kind of leadership from major companies like BlackRock, which as I mentioned before, uh, is the largest asset manager in the world, has over $7 trillion of assets under its management, is a really key part of shifting um, our, our practices. Um, so if you can go to the next, uh, the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the um, the finance mindset uh, that we come across sometimes in our campaigns against major financial institutions, you know, BlackRock, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Liberty Mutual, there's a lot of different big companies that have a lot of money and a lot of power. Um, and when they get critiqued by groups like Amazon Watch, groups like Code Pink, um, they have kind of this, these four steps of uh, neutralizing critiques against them, right? The first one being denial. It's not really our problem. You know, we're, you know, we're just keeping our heads down. We don't really have anything to do with the problem. Um, finance is, is really complicated. You wouldn't understand. Um, two is kind of the inevitability of, uh, of what they're doing. You know, one of the um, kind of critiques that we hear a lot from people um, is, is this, uh, um, belief that if BlackRock doesn't do this, or if, if BlackRock does this, some other group will just swoop in and, and take the uh, shares in the companies that are uh, contributing to fossil, fuel, that are contributing to climate change. So um, there's sort of this like uh, lack of responsibility um, uh, and kind of a, a belief that they just have to follow the market and that their actions actually don't have any impact. 
Um, and then that's sort of linked to the lack of agency, right? That BlackRock is just a fund manager and it's not their responsibility and it's not even their money, that they're just handling it for clients. So they don't really have any sort of say in how to um, intelligently invest that um, in more sustainable uh, industries, right? And then finally, and I think this is a really important one, a lot of these companies um, use diversion uh, as a way to distract from the from the larger problem, right? So they'll do in the environmental world we call it greenwashing, um, but uh, you know in, in other uh, in other uh, kind of uh, campaigns they might they might have a different name for this, but it's basically saying, look, 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 we're you know we put X amount of dollars into a sustainable fund and um, so, you know, we're done, we're done. We've already done everything that we can do. Um, so we can't really be held accountable for, um, you know, you, can, you can't accuse us as be, of being part of the problem because we've already provided this, um, the, you know, this, this nice thing um, that we're doing. So um, while that is, you know, always helpful, it's not, um, unless it's done on a widespread level um, and, uh, you know, really fundamentally changes, uh, the uh, priorities of the company, um, greenwashing or investing in these kinds of um, uh, in you know projects that are going to sort of clean the face of the company really aren't a part of the solution. Um, so uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what's happening on the ground right now in the Amazon. Um, and a little bit about how the current coronavirus pandemic is affecting the people that we work with. Um, and uh, sort of to just contextualize this a little bit, it's important to know that the fight against the fossil fuel and the deforestation commodity industry is only the latest in a really long history of indigenous resistance to outside threats. And really for over 500 years, um, indigenous peoples of the Amazon and across the Americas really have faced invasions of their ancestral territories, racial and social discrimination, the constant threat of physical and cultural extermination um, that's resulted in disease, displacement, and genocide, right? So these peoples, um, particularly uh, indigenous peoples currently living in voluntary isolation, are really gravely threatened by the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic because of their vulnerable immune systems, um, the lack of access to healthcare facilities, um, the lack of potable water and sanitation infrastructure in their territories. Um, and most of that is uh, due in, in large part to government neglect of their territories, right? So um, the current threat of the virus uh, spreading into the Amazon is exacerbated by government policies that encourage destructive industries um, and you know it's it's important to point out that a lot of uh, uh, governments um, in in the Amazon, you know, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, get a lot of their um, and, and Brazil. It's uh, it's important to point out that a lot of these governments get a huge amount of their GDP and of their budget um, from promoting extractive industries in um, Amazonian territories. So. Um, uh, and, and another major threat is organized crime that is entering into these territories in large part because of government neglect. Um, so uh, with all of that, you know, not only are indigenous peoples um, dealing with the threat of global pandemic and the invasion of their territories from unwanted extractivist companies um, and deforestation commodity companies, they're also on the front lines of climate change. So, um, on March 18th, just a few weeks ago, the Bobonasa, the Bobonasa River um, uh, flooded to an unprecedented level, and this really devastated the Sarayaku, Pakayaku, and the Teresa Mama um, communities that live along its banks. Um, so if you could just press play on that, on that video there, um, this is a leader from, a, uh, from that community. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> Maybe closed caption. Oh yeah, that's too bad. Um, well, you can you can. I don't know if people can see the closed caption on there. Um, 
This is essentially uh, Elena Gualinga. She's um, a young indigenous leader um, from the Sarayaku um, indigenous peoples in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And she, um, in that video, is um, uh, explaining uh, sort of what just happened after her community was flooded. And she's really making a point to emphasize um, that this is the result of climate change and it's the result of um, years of extractive companies um, destroying their land. So they've been in a really long battle with um, oil, crude oil extraction companies um, in their territory. And they've seen a huge amount of devastation to their land. Um, and this flood is really just one example, um, one sort of uh, consequence of, of the environmental devastation that they've had um, in the area. So those photos that you can see are of a bridge that connected the community um, uh, to uh, other, other communities. And you can see that the um, bridge has been completely destroyed by the flooding. Um, this is really unprecedented floods that they've never seen. Um, and in the bottom right, uh, you can see a kind of aerial view of their community. Um, so uh, in collaboration with community leaders, uh, Amazon Watch was able to organize an emergency crowdfunding campaign. Um, and we've raised, uh, since launching, over $40,000 um, to help with reconstruction efforts. But really, it's important to point out that this kind of destruction is only going to continue and um, only going to become even more and more frequent as the climate crisis intensifies. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I kind of wanted to leave people with uh, some next steps, right? Um, and talk a little bit more about how uh, our campaign and the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition have been um, affected by coronavirus, as I'm sure you know, ev everybody, um, especially organizers, <clears throat> are, are having to kind of pivot um, at this time. So before the coronavirus pandemic, um, BlackRock's big problem and the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition um, we're planning to join a three day long youth led climate strike, which was taking place um, in cities all over the world on April 22nd, April 23rd and 24th. You all may remember some of the youth climate strikes that took place last year. Um, it was an unprecedented number of participants. I think it was something like over 4 million people around the world participated in these strikes. Um, and uh, it was a really important moment in the climate movement. So we were really hoping to build off of that momentum and obviously um, we, we don't want to endanger folks. Um, so in light of coronavirus, we're going virtual um, and uh, we're going to be hosting an event called Earth Day Live. Some of you may have heard about it. Um, <clears throat> it's at earthdaylive2020.org and I have a, a QRL, um, excuse me, a QR code up there on the screen if anybody wants to uh, check it out. Um, but essentially, April 23rd in that three-day lineup is specifically um, going to be dedicated to highlighting the role that big finance plays um, and that the financial sector plays in the climate crisis. Um, so uh, we're really trying to highlight the, the responsibility that major financial institutions have in um, preventing climate change and moving their money out of fossil fuel and deforestation commodity industries. Um, and this includes asset managers like BlackRock, um, but also insurance companies like Lib Liberty Mutual, um, banks like JP Morgan Chase. Um, and basically right now, thousands of people are preparing to participate in a global live stream. Um, uh, and uh, during that live stream, they're gonna be applying direct pressure to these financial institutions um, and divesting their money um, from them. So uh, we really need as many people as possible um, uh, with us in this fight and the best way for you to get involved is to sign up at that link um, earthdaylive2020.org um, and uh, more than anything really uh, you can control where your money is you can double check um, make sure that your um, that your funds aren't contributing to climate change and um, we have some pretty cool tools for doing that so if you're interested in learning how you personally can divest. Um, you wanna know what your 401k is going to, um, you know, what your Roth IRA is funding. Um, you can go to stopthemoneypipeline.org uh, slash tools. The URL is right there. Um, and we have a lot of tips on 
how you can divest your money, how you can figure out what it's funding currently and what some viable alternative options are. Obviously, we can't uh, advertise a particular fund or a particular um, bank, um, uh, but uh, we can give you the resources to, to try to make that decision on your own. Um, so yeah, essentially, uh, I, I will end here, but um, just kind of want to um, thank everybody for taking the time to listen and, and to understand kind of the, the links between these major financial institutions like BlackRock um, and climate destruction in the Amazon um, and uh, really the importance of all of us in being conscious about our, our consumption and what our money is funding. Thanks. Thank you, Pendle, for that very thorough presentation um, that uh, really gave us an overview of who BlackRock is, what they do, and why uh, we as activists and as a community uh, need to hold them accountable and hold their feet to the fire. Uh, but Pendle, I do have uh, some questions here for you. Um, so let's go to, um, I have a question here about uh, BlackRock's role as a majority shareholder. Um, is BlackRock a majority shareholder or a plurality shareholder in most cases? What are examples of companies in which it holds and can vote a majority of shares? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not sure I can uh, speak to the difference between plurality versus majority shareholder, but by majority shareholder I meant um, that they own more than 5% of total shares in a company, um, in a publicly traded company. So um, I think I gave an example uh, in the presentation, but um, uh, I think Bunge and JBS are two examples of soy companies where uh, BlackRock is a majority shareholder. So that means that um, they, uh, usually it means that they have a, a, a seat on the company's board of directors, um, that they are present for any shareholder um, uh, proposals and they can vote on those. Um, and they can vote on things like, you know, um, uh, resolutions about how we're going to be accountable to indigenous communities or what the process is going to be like when we are looking for other lands to um, to exploit. Um, they could even, uh, you know, be informing companies on uh, really pushing them to uh, prioritize more sustainable forms of, of extraction or of if, if it's an agribusiness company, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, have more sustainable methods of cultivation. Um, so there's really a, a wide variety of ways that um, their leadership um, could positively affect um, a, mo a general move towards more sustainable um, uh, energy sector. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question. But, yeah. Well, hopefully um, <laughs> It answers, answers some of it. So um, I have another question here for you, Pendel. Um, you know, doing this work can be really um, challenging for some, um, especially around uh, finance and talking about shareholders. So how can someone effectively communicate our concerns to elected officials? What do you suggest uh, we do when we write a letter to our elected officials and they respond with a polar plate response that basically shows that they did not even read the letter. Um, <laughs> what do you have to say about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I think that there's always um, strength in numbers and it, um, in data, having data that can really back you up. Um, one thing that I want to add to the, actually to the previous question, um, that I think is probably helpful um, is the report that Amazon Watch just recently published um, uh, really highlights um, a series of not just the major, so let me break it down a little bit. We, we were looking at indigenous rights violations, particularly in the Western Amazon, um, as they were related to crude oil extraction in that region. 
Um, and we wanted to kind of draw this link for folks between um, where crude oil extraction was happening and indigenous resistance on the ground to those projects and companies and the financial institutions that were um, funding them or that had majority shareholder status or that had um, underwritten them with bonds and, and loans. Um, so we just recently published a report um, that uh, identifies five of the uh, five really key financial institutions. Let me see if I can uh, name all of them. Uh, BlackRock, JP Morgan Chase, HSBC, Citigroup, um, and uh, Goldman Sachs um, are funding uh, and financing uh, four major uh, crude oil extraction companies that are operating in the Western Amazon that we already have documented evidence of um, indigenous resistance and, and uh, violation of, of indigenous rights that these companies have have um, have uh, done. So um, I think having that kind of data to back you up, um, you can go to our website, you can check out our report. Um, it's called Investing in Amazon Crude um, and um, really working in numbers to put pressure on elected officials, to pressure these companies to change um, our, uh, our policies at the federal level around regulation of the financial in uh, industry, excuse me, um, is, is one method. Um, but I think, um, you know, there's, there's the, the policy route where we're changing policy and that's definitely an important piece of what we're doing, um, arguably the most important piece. Um, but there's also just our role as individuals um, and making sure that our money is really not financing these companies and when it is letting these companies know um, that you're concerned about that because ultimately they can't exist without your money. So um, if you're feeling like you're not getting an adequate response from an elected official, I would, I would advise, you know, looking at your own funds, um, you know, talking with other friends, sitting down, maybe organizing a day where you're going to check out some of those resources that I, that I shared um, from South Money Pipeline Coalition um, to just sort of figure out what are some of the what are some of the ways that our money is contributing to this crisis and, and how can we let more people know about how they can prevent that from happening? Great, thank you, Pendle. And I just wanna let everyone know that's joining us. If you have any more questions, please put them in the chat box or in the Q&A section of the screen. And also this um, webinar is being recorded and will be available to you on YouTube um, in a day or so. Um, I wanted to open it up to Cody and see if there's anything that he would like to add. He's been listening patiently. Uh, patiently and very rapt. This is an amazing uh, comprehensive uh, presentation, Pendle. Um, I know I'm learning a lot. Uh, and what I'm thinking is that um, uh, there's so much information here uh, that is so useful for divestment act activists in general, but especially ones working on such a big like financial monstrosity <laughs> like BlackRock is. Um, and obviously at Code Pink, our focus is on companies that are profiting off of war production. Um, but as you've demonstrated, um, it's, that's, it's equally important to target the way that companies profit off of fossil fuel industry, deforestation, and violating indigenous sovereignty. So I think that there's a lot of um, possibilities for strong coalition work on a campaign like this. So I'm wondering if you have any lessons to share for the participants about any kinds of coalition work you've done with other movements um, to target this one company. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I have to be honest, like, as I mentioned, I'm pretty new um, to, to the work. So um, I can really only talk about the, the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition um, and, and the Black Rocks Big Problem campaign. But I can say um, that the campaign is, is um, you know, we, we have some of the, those key environmentalist groups that I mentioned, but we're also working with, um, you know, really grassroots community organizing um, organizations. So um, New York Communities for Change, for example. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with them, but they do a lot of organizing in black and brown communities in New York City. Um, and so really kind of highlighting the link between um, environmental destruction in the Amazon and environmental racism that's happening here in the United States. Um, you know, uh, we've done some work with uh, groups in California 
um, that wanted to get crude oil extraction companies out of um, communities in California. And there's sort of this, uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert on it, um, but there's a there's this dichotomy that we're seeing between, um, well, California is a huge uh, oil consumer. Um, where is it going to get its oil from? If it's not going to get its oil from uh, communities in California, then maybe it'll have to get them from um, get it from communities in, in the Amazon. And so sort of forming coalitions between those different groups, I think, is a really key part of um, of this fight and kind of understanding the links between um, environmental destruction, uh, you know, racism, classism, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways that this, that this work connects. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I can, that's what I can say about coalition building. But I think if anybody is curious to learn more, to kind of brainstorm about other ways that we can support um, what y'all are doing, please, please do reach out. Um, Cause I think we're all on the same team. Great, thank you, Pendle. And um, we had a, a question here. Can we post this webinar um, to BlackRock? Well, can we tweet this webinar to BlackRock? And if it's okay with you, we'd like to yes. tweet this once it's up on YouTube. <laughs> Go for it. We, we, uh, we, we bug them plenty on Twitter, so they, I'm sure they, they won't be surprised, but please do, yeah. <laughs> Great, and then a Pendle final, final question. Um, not part of the script. It's kind of off the script. Um, just wanted to see if you or anyone at Amazon Watch has any uh, thoughts about uh, Larry Fink being tapped to help uh, the White House during this economic crisis that we're going through. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and maybe I can send you, um, I know that we were part of a, a statement that we put out with a bunch of other groups um, specifically on that exact issue uh, recently. So I can find that and send it to you after this, uh, after this webinar um, to share with folks. But yeah, there's a huge amount of concern um, from uh, people in the Stop Enemy Pipeline Coalition and from BlackRock's Big Problem Campaign in particular, um, because BlackRock has essentially just been handed the reins to um, a tremendous amount of power um, and decision making around um, what <laughs> what our money is going to fund um, coming out of this crisis. And a lot of, um, I, I think it kind of goes without saying, but a lot of uh, groups are really using this desperate situation to forward agendas that are going to make it harder to protect um, uh, folks kind of on the bottom of the pyramid here, you know, uh, destroying social safety nets, um, destroying environmental protections. Um, and it's really, really important uh, that we call attention to that issue. So yeah, there's a huge amount of concern about um, BlackRock essentially being picked to lead the country out of this um, crisis uh, when, as, as you can see from this presentation, they're really not walking the talk. So um, uh, yeah, that's a huge concern of ours. Great, thank you. Um, we are too concerned about him uh, being tapped. Um, I have another question here for you. Are there ways you're working with the Amazonian indigenous people? Can you share some um, some examples? Yeah, um, well, as I mentioned in, in the presentation, we, um, we have been organizing um, really this is a crisis, right? So we're not a humanitarian aid organization. We're an advocacy organization. It's important to point that out. But because we're in a crisis mode right now, we've been really called on um, by a lot of our indigenous partners to help get as many funds um, and supplies to uh, the region as quickly as possible. So we've been um, supporting folks, uh, different different indigenous people's crowdfunding campaigns. Um, we've also, we have a what's called the Amazon Defenders Fund. We've been able to, fortunately, um, we've uh, been uh, very successful in, in fundraising um, over the last uh, year or so. And we've been able to open up new um, re-granting opportunities for indigenous partners. So. Um, we have a Amazon Defenders Fund, um, which we've been able to um, disperse to various indigenous partners who are asking us for, um, you know, money. But usually we use that um, or, or partners use that to organize protests or to travel, um, to uh, meet with one another, to sort of organize um, coalition building efforts. Um, and right now it's really all about getting folks 
supplies, you know, masks, soap, um, food, you know, people are really, um, and, and in the case of the um, the community, the Sarayaku community that uh, the video that I shared earlier, um, you know, we've raised that money to help them um, rebuild their communities that are being completely destroyed by climate change. So um, those are all examples of ways that we that we work with indigenous partners. Um, and again, I can't stress it enough, you know, we're not a humanitarian aid organization, we're really um, trying to uh, kind of redistribute <laughs> wealth and, and give folks the autonomy to decide what they want to do with um, with the money. So um, yeah, those are some examples of, of ways that we're supporting folks. And we actually just um, organized a uh, Amazon-wide uh, statement of, of solidarity among different uh, Indigenous groups that are calling for a moratorium on, on all entry into um, the Amazon and into indigenous territories and asking for an immediate cease, uh, uh, cease and desist or seizure of um, any extractive uh, industries. So, um, you know, we need, we need to stop um, oil extraction, logging, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just share this briefly. I know I'm, I'm talking too much, but um, <laughs> there's a, a threat of religious proselytization um, in the Amazon um, and the Bolsonaro um, uh, administration in Brazil has just recently appointed um, a pretty well-known uh, missionary um, as the head of uh, the indigenous uh, sort of relations department of the Brazilian uh, government. And this is a huge uh, danger to indigenous peoples there because um, this, this group is not only entering into their territory and risking, um, it, you know, impeding on their cultural, their culture and their way of life, but also obviously bringing, uh, there's a huge threat that they will bring this uh, disease um, into these communities. So, um, yeah, we've been organizing with, uh, with communities and trying to show a united front against all of these kind of threats. Um, and yeah, yeah, you know, I, I encourage folks to come to our website and, and learn a little bit more about the work that we do with Indigenous leaders on the ground in the Amazon. Well, incredible work that you all are doing at Amazon Watch. Thank you so much, Pendo. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Carly, who will be closing us out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Pendle, and thank you everyone for all of your um, really insightful questions. Learned a lot during this webinar. Um, you know, it was really amazing hearing from you, Pendle, about, um, you know, how you all are taking on BlackRock and really an entire world of finance capital um, that profits from death and destruction. Obviously, um, the same companies that are profiting from climate change are also profiting a lot of the time from um, producing weapons of war. And um, so here at Code Pink, we also know that if we're going to take on the war machine uh, in all of its forms, we have to start by organizing in our local communities. So quickly, I just wanted to share my screen um, with folks um, and just to go over some of the things that we're doing at Code Pink that really intersect with the work that you're doing, Pendel. Um, so let me just present. Okay. Beautiful. Um, so I wanted to share this image because I think it really shows very clearly how the work that you're doing intersects with our work. The image says save the rainforest, burn fascism, right? So if we're really going to take on companies that are um, killing the Amazon, we also have to understand the role that weapons manufacturers play in perpetuating um, U.S. imperialism worldwide. Um, so, and then of course on the right you can see the the sign that says war is not green and, and it really shows that the US military and in particular the Pentagon is one of the world's leading um, emitters of carbon, single largest emitters of carbon, right? So these connections are really clear between the war machine and um, making climate change worse. Um, so people can learn more about that connection by going to um, codepink.org slash wing, which is our war is not green campaign. Um, right, so but if, again, if we're really going to take on the war machine, we have to organize in our local communities. So I wanted to give people um, some really quick next steps about how you can actually do that. Um, you know, our Divest from the War Machine campaign that we run at Code Pink um, really focuses on removing our, all of our invested assets from companies that derive their profits 
from uh, US military, military interventions around the world, as well as the global arms trade. So we do this work at the state, city, and university level. We also work to demand that our politicians stop taking campaign contributions from weapons manufacturers and then vote to go to war. Um, so as far as next steps go, I would really encourage everyone on this call to make sure that you sign on to our petition demanding that BlackRock CEO, uh, Larry Fink, who Pendle mentioned, um, divest from the war machine, right? BlackRock is also um, one of the world's largest investors in weapons manufacturers worldwide. Um, and then second, I would really encourage everyone here to sign up to join or start a divest campaign in your local community. So we'll send this link around to everyone, but if you sign up there um, and you tell us, you know, if you wanna work on divesting your city council or divesting university endowment or talking to your local politician about stopping to take, um, stopping taking uh, campaign contributions from weapons manufacturers, uh, Code Pink organizer will be in contact with you and we can start to build this movement against BlackRock and weapons manufacturers more broadly. So, let's okay, well, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pendle, for taking time out of your, um, well, it's, it's the morning here in, <laughs> in, in California afternoon on the East Coast. Um, and I just uh, would like to let everyone know that uh, we have five Divest from the War Machine webinars uh, coming up. So definitely keep your eye out for that. Um, but I think we are done for the day. Thank you so much, Pendo, for, um, for sharing uh, your information about BlackRock and the campaign work that you are doing there at Amazon. Um, have a great one and stay safe. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Bye -bye. Thank you.